In this lesson, I'll explain the range or penetration of each type of radiation, the effect of a magnetic field as the radiation passes through, and something about the nature, what is each type of radiation. But first of all, the range or penetration of each type. Setting up a simulation here with a radioactive source, a sheet of paper, some way away, a thin sheet of aluminium, and then a sheet of fairly thick lead. Using a simulation because radioactivity is impossible to actually see. In practice, the whole thing would have to be in a vacuum because air does absorb some of the radioactivity. First of all then, alpha radiation. Well, alpha radiation doesn't get very far, even in a vacuum. It is stopped by a thin sheet of paper. And if there were air in here, then its range would only be two, three, four, five centimetres at the most. Next, beta radiation passes comfortably through the piece of paper, but is stopped by a thin sheet of aluminium. If there were air in here, the range would be greater than that for alpha, perhaps 30, maybe 40 centimetres. On to gamma radiation. Gamma passes comfortably through the sheet of paper, through the thin sheet of aluminium, and is reduced, attenuated by the lead, but is not completely stopped. In fact, it is very difficult to absorb all of gamma radiation. In air, it will spread out and be slightly absorbed by it, but it has an almost infinite range. Again, using a simulation, I'm going to explain the effect of a magnetic field and a little about why it's important. Arranging radiation to pass through the poles of a magnet or between the poles of a magnet. The magnetic field, of course, from north to south. Starting with alpha radiation. Maybe I've made this demonstration just a little realistically too fast. Slowing it down and then maybe a little further you can see that the radiation is pushed by the magnetic field out of the field, upwards in this case. Next, beta radiation. I've tried to assume here that the side of the magnet is transparent, so you can see the path, which is downwards, rather more sharply than for alpha radiation. It's pushed down and out of the magnetic field. And finally, gamma radiation much easier to see, although unrealistically slow, gamma radiation passes straight through the magnetic field, totally unaffected by it. So summarising each of these in turn, alpha radiation is pushed up out of the magnetic field. Notice that the alpha particles travel in a straight line until they get to the field, and then travel in a straight line once they've left. Within the field, they travel in a smooth curve, part of a circle, in this simulation, the deflection has been grossly exaggerated from what would normally be the case. Part of the reason for using the simulation is so you can actually see what happens. But the shape of the line and the deflection upwards through the magnetic field, when it's arranged like this, is absolutely correct. The beta radiation is pushed in a curve downwards. It looks as if it comes forward here out of the magnetic field, but it doesn't. It's just the way it's drawn. It goes downwards. The curved section is part of a circle. The curve is far sharper than it is for alpha radiation. In fact, this is very badly and inaccurately drawn. The radius of the curve for beta radiation would be hundredths of that of alpha radiation. I'll explain why in just a moment. Gamma radiation, you remember, passes straight through the field with no deflection whatsoever. Nice and easy to observe and understand. We can make sense of what these radiations actually are using this information and some further experiments. This is an outline of an experiment done by Ernest Rutherford to find something out about the nature of alpha particles. He trapped an alpha source within a, an evacuated tube and at each end of the tube he attached electrodes, which were in turn attached to a very high voltage supply. Running this for over a week, he found at first there was no light at all coming from the tube. But after several days, a current started to pass through the tube, 
and when that happened, some light was emitted. That light could be analysed using a diffraction grating, or, more likely at that time, a prism, refracted so that the colour spectrum was split up and placed on a screen. The colours that were observed, the red, the green and the purple, were typical for a helium spectrum, for helium gas. So the fact that alpha particles are positively charged, together with this last piece of conclusive evidence, shows that alpha particles are helium nuclei, consisting of two protons and two neutrons. The identification of beta radiation was in some ways more straightforward, simply by measuring the amount of deflection in a known magnetic or electric field. This work was done by Becquerel in 1900, and he found the same results that J.J. Thompson had found for the electron, concluding, therefore, that beta radiation was a stream of electrons. I mentioned earlier that the track taken by beta radiation is much sharper than for alpha radiation. The curve of alpha particles is perhaps two or three hundred times the radius of that of the beta particles. That's not because beta has a greater charge. In fact, it hasn't. It's only got a charge of one minus, whereas alpha has a charge of two plus. The difference comes because the mass of beta particles is tiny compared to alpha, almost one ten thousandth of that, so it's much easier to push aside. I must mention here that there is a type of beta radiation which has exactly the opposite properties to the beta radiation described up to here. It will, in a magnetic field, be deflected upwards, but it has the same charge and mass ratio as the beta electrons except that they are positively charged rather than negatively charged. This is a stream of positrons, fairly unusual, but certainly not unknown. Gamma radiation was identified as something different and peculiar on its own, as alpha and beta were discovered in the early 1900s, but it wasn't until about 20 years later that its actual nature was decided upon. Added to the two key properties that it is very penetrating, and that it has no electrical charge. In about 1920 it was discovered that it would reflect from some crystalline surfaces. It was accurately concluded that this therefore was a form of electromagnetic radiation, one of extremely short wavelength, very high frequency. Thank you for watching. There are notes to accompany this video lesson.